Welcome back to the Freedom Unchained channel. Another lesson from George Gordon, Common Law School. If you guys haven't checked out this course from the beginning, go to the playlist and check it out from the beginning. If you're really interested in learning what law truly is and funnel through all the lies of the government like normal, please subscribe to the channel and hit the bell notification so you can get the next video upload. Please also share this video around. Let's start getting the word out for freedom. Of course, leave a comment, like algorithms will help spread this video around. And also support the channel by going to the new page that I set up to help guide the projects that I wish to be working on. So I hope you guys come over there and join me or support me in some way. I'm sure there'll be job postings up for people if they want to help with uh, websites or make articles or whatever skills that you have. I'm sure I can use them. Just get in contact with me. Check out the website. Look out for the mastermind that is going to be built. It's going to be grown as we build it. So a lot of going on and let's get to George Gordon, Common Law School. Well, greetings again. We're going to do lesson five today and this is called search and seizure. Now, as you will remember when we went through lesson three and we talked about the exclusionary rule, we didn't get into Miranda and I wanted to finish Miranda in that lesson and it ran a little over time, so I'm going to get into the second half of the Miranda case today. And the reason I want to go with Miranda is to show you that the Miranda case is probably the most significant civil rights case to come down in this century insofar as protecting the individual liberties of citizens. When we were talking about Miranda the last time, we left off on page 458 with the testatrix formula. Now, the first half of Miranda actually isn't half of it from the beginning up to page 458. I like to cover that one at the scene of the crime or the jailhouse scene to give you an introduction to let you know what the police are going to do to you, what your government officials are going to do to you, that IRS examiner, that Department of Employment uh, examiner, or any of these government bureaucrats. Remember, they are trained to gain evidence and information from you to use against you in a court of law. And the citizen is not trained. And so then he, in good faith, believing in his own innocence and believing that he's just a nice everyday garden variety Joe six-pack, uh, gives them the admissions and confessions that they then warp and twist, use out of context, lie about, trick, cajole, give you false legal advice, use Mutt and Jeff tactics on you, and use other devious means with which then to convict you, or if not you, your neighbor next door. And my first question has always got to be, why is it that we want to put citizens in jail? Why do we want convictions? Of what value is it to convict your next door neighbor of any type of a crime? There is no advantage to you, there is great advantage to the law enforcement growth industry because that makes your neighbor next door a customer in the law enforcement growth industry and there isn't anything in government that's logical, reasonable, or makes any common sense when we're talking about convictions, crime, and criminal process. It just isn't there. Locking your neighbor up and spending $75,000 isn't productive to you, it isn't productive to him, and it, it creates a nightmare. Are we saying then, in effect, that what we need to do is to put every citizen in America in jail for all of his crimes, for all of his infractions? I was in court yesterday, and I asked a judge and a prosecutor to dismiss a case because I had failed to omit, that is, I omitted to get a driver's license, and pursuant to a technical move in the statute, which I won't get into a long detail over, I said, you can only omit, you can only commit an act, or if that's, that's a ridiculous term, you can only commit an omission one time. You either go in and get a driver's license or you don't get a driver's license. And if you don't, you've omitted and you've broken the law. Now, once you've been convicted of breaking that law, then it's double jeopardy to come back and say, well, we're going to charge you with not, with not buying the driver's license. And I'm sitting there saying, wait a minute. If I robbed the 7-Eleven store and I pled guilty and you put me in jail, that's one. Are you going to keep charging me for the same act forever? Well, how can you keep charging me for the same omission forever? 
And their position was that every time I got in that car and used it on the road, that is a separate crime. That's a separate act. And it costs $40 each time. So let's suppose that I used my car 10 times in one day. That's $400 worth of violations. I mean, if we wanted to get pharisaical about it, wouldn't we say then that every citizen in America is a criminal? Every citizen in America violates laws. I can come into your house and find building code violations and electrical and plumbing code violations if you're a little old lady from uh, East Podunk, Iowa, and you've never thought about breaking the law and you've been to church every Sunday for all your life. I can find violations of law that could put you in jail. And this kind of philosophy is absolutely insane. We're not criminals. Our government is using statutory provisions to tax us through the police power. Now we come to Miranda. And on page 458, the court said, well, what if this test of tricks were tricked and cajoled into doing something against her will? She didn't really want to, but through the brainwashing and the techniques of government power and police, she gave her uh, wealth to, uh, who was it here, Bill and Joe, or Joe and Sam, John and Jane. Well, then, is it any different when you're charged with this criminal case, when your policeman comes up and says, you were driving 75 miles an hour and you're a criminal. Now, we're going to punish you for this. And the poor fellow's been to school, you know, he's been to the government schools. Oh, yes, I, I understand that. Now, here's what happens. You walk into the courtroom and the judge says, Mr. Johnson, you've been charged with speeding 75 miles an hour in a 55-mile zone. Do you understand those charges? Oh, yes, Your Honor, I understand those charges. And how do you plead to those charges? I plead guilty with explanation, Your Honor. So here's a fellow who says, yes, I understand the intent and I understand the criminal act. You don't have a corpus delecti. You don't have any damage. You don't have a loss of any life, liberty, or property. There's no cause of action whatsoever at law before the court. There's no substance, so there's no jurisdiction. There's no way in the world that you can get a conviction except through a penal statute wherein you signed at the bottom line and agreed that you were guilty of this crime. And so the entire law enforcement growth industry and all of us citizens have been trained. I mean literally from the day you went into the kidney garden of your government school, you've been trained to believe that an act is a crime. And it isn't. Acts are not crimes. Look at the word crime in any dictionary, and you'll find that a crime requires act with intent. And so, in our state, they're charging us with misdemeanors and calling those crimes. Well, sure, you can do that, but you have to do it with consent. You cannot compel a man into a contract against his will and over his objection. You can't compel a man to give up his rights. You can convince him that he should. You can take him into the police station and you can sit there and you can convince that fellow that he ought to uh, confess and that he ought to buy this or that. That's salesmanship. You know when that uh, uh, salesman comes into your living room to sell you insurance and he convinces you after two hours that you ought to buy this. He's not cramming that down your throat. He's going to put that contract out in front of you and he's going to say sign right here on the bottom line. You go into that traffic court and the way they do it here in Idaho, they say to you, uh, can you pay that today? Uh, yes. And then you'll go over and you'll sign a payment agreement. If you can't pay it today, you sign a payment agreement. If you can, you go over and pay it. And when a fellow pleads guilty here in Idaho, the judge says, do you know of any lawful reason why I cannot pass sentence on you today? If the judge had the capacity and the power to pass sentence against the fellow, against his will and over his objection, why does he need to ask, do you know of any lawful reason? Don't even waste time asking me, yes, Your Honor, I've got five reasons why you cannot pass sentence upon me today. There's no lawful money of substance. You've denied me counsel. You can't put me in jail because of Argersanger versus Hamlet. And I can go on and on. Those are reasons why you can't lock me up, why you cannot exact the fine, why this court doesn't have jurisdiction, why this court cannot impose any penalties. But you know, not the, uh, the average fellow. He doesn't know that and he doesn't understand that. And so the Supreme Court, in a break from some tradition, I don't say a break from all tradition, the Fifth Amendment's not tampered with at all. Miranda breaks with the concept or the tradition that 
If you fail to demand a right, it's waived. In this case, not just Miranda, but I mean in this subject matter, when there's an in-custody interrogation, you don't have to demand your right to remain silent. You should. You don't have to. That policeman has got to tell you that you've got that right to remain silent. Now, that doesn't apply, to my knowledge, in any other rights arena. You'd better demand your right to due process and equal protection, your right to be taken to a magistrate, if that's the case. Any statutory provisions, you're going to have to demand those. But in Miranda, we have a, uh, a break then because of these severe these absolutely malicious, criminal activities of the police, lighted cigarette butts on the backs of third-party witnesses and beatings that put people in jail for eight months. I personally was choked unconscious to take my fingerprints. And I could go on and on and on. I can tell you from first-hand observation that police brutality is as rampant today as it ever was in the 30s or at any time in history. Never changes. The only thing that changes is the degree with which the police apply that to the majority of the citizens. I, in my observations, have noted that the police pick on the young and the poor and the least educated and run those people through the system over and over and over again. And those people become the clients or the customers of the law enforcement growth industry at your expense and you're paying for it and they're helpless and they can do absolutely nothing for themselves. And the high court then has made some rulings to help those people who cannot help themselves by demanding that a public prosecutor be appointed for them. I should say public defender. That They're actually one and the same. They eat out of the same trough. So this public defender defends them. I had a fellow in jail the other day, and I said, uh, Larry, uh, let me ask you a question. Where are you from? I'm from California. Gosh, that's interesting. I was from California. What part? And we bandied about, you know, some discussion. And pretty soon I said, well, what did you do down here? Well, when I got out of college, I was a public defender. Is that right, Larry? Gosh, that's interesting. Well, <clears throat> how long? Five years. Man, that's a long time to be in the public defender's office. Boy, you must have had some real interesting cases. Oh, yeah, rape, robbery, muggings, and hold-ups. Boy, the worst kind of people. Did you ever win any cases? Uh, no, come think of it, never did. That wasn't our job, though. See, our job is to guide them through the legal process and see to it that their rights are protected. That's all. Well, the Supreme Court then in this Miranda case is trying to address a part of that problem. There isn't any doubt but what the police can charge these people. I'm talking about the poor, the indigent, and that's the typical hippie kid who, you know, you see them all the time. They're on the freeway. He's hitchhiking, you know. Maybe he's got ten bucks in his pocket if it's a big day. And he's on his way to somewhere. The policeman stops. Hey, you. Come here. He comes over and, what's your name? Show me some identification. No protection pursuant to Brown versus Texas. No probable cause that this fellow is committing any crimes or is involved in any activities whatsoever. He knows that if this guy has got long hair and got a beard, he's probably got an ounce of marijuana on him. Most of those people smoke marijuana, and my question is, who cares? I don't care. I don't care if the guy eats cyanide every night for dinner. He dies. So what? That's his problem, not mine. The policeman then arrests, you know, they'll get into this little discussion, and then the policeman will search his knapsack, no probable cause, no Fourth Amendment warrant, He'll ask him questions. He's not in custody. This fellow doesn't know enough to shut his mouth and not say anything, and so they get to searching through him, and they, they find an ounce of marijuana. They arrest him. They take him into jail. And you know what that costs? Do you know how much time, effort, and energy is involved in that type of thing? you got this policeman. He's probably being paid uh, $75 a day, and he has to have something to do, and so he, as a part of his daily routine, he arrests this guy. They used to do this with vagrants when I was a kid. Don't have $5 in your pocket? Take you to jail. The Supreme Court addressed that issue some years ago and said, leave, the, leave these indigents alone. That doesn't mean that police don't have vagrancy laws across the nation. Whatever the Supreme Court says doesn't really have any great effect on the judicial system at the lowest levels 
or on the police. I can sit here and quote uh, Supreme Court law to these jailers and policemen around my local area, and they laugh and sneer. They, they I had a policeman the other day. He, hey, I think this Gordon's one of those constitutionalists. Hey, Gordon, are you one of those constitutionalists? That's right. As if I was a communist, a Nazi, or some kind of a subversive. You know, my reply is, let me ask you a question, officer. Are you telling me that you're not a constitutionalist? Conversation broke down. He didn't want to tell me. My only observation must be that, you know, you, it's, it's the old story. You know, you put this kid in school and you open his head up and you funnel in a bunch of information. You close his head up and that's what comes out. And that's the kind of people we're dealing with here. They don't have any capacity to think logically and reasonably. Well... I'm not saying that all people are that way. I'm just saying that in the broad spectrum of people that I deal with, we don't have any capacity to think and use their heads because the guy's been to the government schools and he's trained then to become a schoolboy. People are trained to become schoolboys all the way through their lives. And in government service, you know, the very first day you went to school and you're in kindergarten and you took papers home, you know, you carry them like this, you know, you carry your papers home, show them to mommy. And if you're bad, you know the teacher or somebody tells you, boy, you're in trouble now. And this carries on through school. Pretty soon you graduate from high school, you go to college. What changes? You get a desk and you got papers and somebody comes along and corrects you because you're not neat and you're not tidy. You get out of college and where do you go? Well, you go work for the Department of Employment or some government office and they give you a desk and there's papers to shuffle around. And you go all the way through your life. You know the only difference between in a government office is the only difference between recess and coffee break at 10 o'clock is the name of it. I mean, it's, you know, we're going to recess. And you think about it for a moment, from the time you're in the fifth grade until the time you retire from government service at age 65 or whatever age you retire at, you're just a glorified schoolboy all the way through your life. Just taught and trained to do what you're told. The bell rings, you go, and you go out, and the bell rings, and you come back in, and that sort of thing. Now, you say to yourself, well, what's that got to do with Miranda? I'm going to show you. Because... The Supreme Court has to address the issues of rights. Do, do people who are walking up and down the freeways have rights? And if the police can just go search this hippie kid hitchhiking down the freeway, they can just come and search anybody, just arrest anybody, just question these people, just question you. And, then, and of course, we're trained in the government schools, and so we just sit here and answer their questions. Have you got any marijuana? Well, just a little bit, officer, but, you know, don't hassle me too bad. You're under arrest, and away you go to jail. He doesn't even have any right to ask you the question. He doesn't even have a right to ask you your name. They do it. He can't come out there and demand. We had a fellow here not long ago who, fortunately, is a trained and competent pro se litigant, and he's out here in the, I think it was out on Barrister Street, and he's uh, there for some trial or reason, and this marshal comes up and says, Hey, are you Mr. Uh, Jones? Who wants to know? Well, I've got a warrant here for Mr. Jones. Well, if I run into him, I'll let you know about it. Well, Mr. Jones, uh, I have reason to believe that you're Mr. Jones, and I'm going to arrest you. Boy, he was lucky, because had I been standing right over there, you know, I would have uh, said, well, what do you want, what do you want me for? I'd, I'd entrap him into arresting the wrong man if I could. Anyway, he got the right guy. And this man doesn't carry any identification. That's right. Uh, most of the people that I know that are competent pro se's don't carry any identification. I don't carry identification. <gasps> you don't carry identification? No, I know who I am. And I don't really care whether you know who I am or not. That's not important. I know who I am, and I don't need to carry any papers around in my pocket identifying myself. You want to know who I am? If I want to let you know who I am, I'll tell you who I am. My right to privacy supersedes your need to know. And that's where that's at. So anyway, uh, this fellow, he's pretty lively, and they took him in, and they started searching. See, as soon as they arrest you, they know they're going to get your wallet, and they're going to find out who you are. And they searched him, and nothing. They didn't know now if they've got Mr. Jones or not, did they? Well, where's your identification? Why would I want to carry identification? Well, how do you go downtown? Well, I get in my car and I drive downtown. Is there some checkpoint down there that you have to have uh, identification to get into downtown now? What kind of a police study you're running here? You see, 
These government bureaucrats are so used to carrying around their little ID cards and their little ID tags and their identification in their pockets, and then we've gone into the, into the school systems and we've taught everybody that they have to be, you know, they've got uh, social security numbers and they've got all kinds of cards and student body cards and numbers and pictures and all this on there. I don't need any of I don't know whether you need it or not. I'm just telling you I don't need it. And so your Supreme Court then, for those few people left in the United States who want to use the Constitution as the backbone or as their foundation to law, I don't know if there's five or ten of us left, but whatever, you know, ten, fifteen of us, the Supreme Court then sits there to protect our rights. And they're not throwing this fellow Miranda out onto the streets to beat us up and rape, rob, and pillage us. What they're doing is saying, you policemen over there who are incompetent and who are, and who are continually breaking the law by placing lighted cigarette butts on disinterested third-party persons' backs to make them confess and give you information illegally and unlawfully, then we're going to have to make some rulings here because of your incompetence we're going to reverse this conviction because you did it illegally. And only these criminal people take these cases to the Supreme Court. You and I, the honest citizen, haven't been going into the courts because it's been so easy for us to just go out there like sheeple to our traffic courts and then plead guilty and give them the $40 that we haven't stood up on our back legs and said, wait a minute, mister, do you know who you work for? And we haven't been doing that. And so now when a few of us start doing that, these public servants, they feel like they're threatened now. They, they think that we're criminals because we're demanding our rights when we should have been demanding our rights for years and years. Now, let's go through this Miranda Doctrine and let's take a look with that little bit of background at some of the statements here that the Supreme Court makes. And let's take a look at their thinking in relationship to this thing of whether or not that policeman can ask you questions, take you into custody, haul you into jail, and whether or not he can seize the marijuana. Because, you know, if you've got any uh, knowledge at all, you just tell him, I'm not going to tell you, you absolutely can't look, you arrest you, takes you to jail. You assert your constitutional rights. He finds the ounce of marijuana. They confiscate it and lose it, and they couldn't convict you in 55 millenniums. That's a fact. Can't convict you. Don't plead guilty. Make them spend $1,500 to convict you. You know, if every citizen of America would plead not guilty, whether he is guilty or not, we wouldn't have any more of this balloon. We could put an end to it. Wouldn't take anywhere near that many as a matter of practical fact. Well, in any rate... In any event, let's start out on page 458, and the word where it says number two right in the center of the page, I've underlined where it starts down there where it says, perhaps, and you turn the page, and it's perhaps the critical historical event shedding light on its origins and evolution was the trial of one John Lilborn, a vocal anti-Stuart leveler, who was made to take the Star Chamber Oath in 1637. And so here's your Supreme Court going back to 1637 to see if they can get a handle on this thing called the Fifth Amendment. The oath would have bound him to answer to all questions posed to him on any subject. So here back in 1637 is the Star Chamber Chancellor coming in saying, you're going to take this oath. The trial of John Lilborn and John Wharton, three how, uh, back in 13, uh, it's uh, three how, S-T-T-R, I don't know what that means. Boy, I'm telling you, this is an old case. Uh, which was decided in 1637, by the way. Uh, he resisted the oath and, and declaimed the proceeding, stating, and here's the defendant now saying, another fundamental right I then contended for was that no man's conscience ought to be racked by oaths imposed, imposed to answer to questions concerning himself in matters criminal or pretended to be so. Pretended crime. This is Haller versus Davies, the leveler tracks. Well, there's some historical background. Now we're going to go back to 1637, says our Supreme Court, and we're going to start reading some quotations as in the second half of Miranda to give you some foundation to find out why did these judges think this way. They knew, down at the bottom of the page, and yours should be underlined, and you should be following along with me now in your Miranda book, and I think that's uh, Supreme Court Decisions, Book 5. I don't use those books. I use these because they're in loose leaf form, and I'm so much more used to using these teaching aids than I am those books that uh, 
I couldn't find my way through it with a map. So you should be on page 436 now, the bottom of the page, where it says, They knew that illegitimate and unconstitutional practices get their first footing by silent approaches and slight deviations from legal modes of procedure. And they quoted that from Boyd v. United States, 116 U.S., in 1886. I think I've said 1876, so I'll uh, correct that. Now we know the Boyd case was decided in 1886. So here's the government by what they call silent approaches and slight deviations. You know, the police don't come right out and just change or violate or break the law, you know. They use subtle and crafty innovations for slightly altering your rights. And you've got to demand rights in order to have them. All right, let's flip over here to the next page and down at the bottom of page 460. I have uh, underlined here at the very bottom of the page after Chambers versus Florida, in sum, the privilege is fulfilled only when the person is guaranteed the right to remain silent until he chooses to speak in the unfettered, underline the word unfettered again, the unfettered exercise of his own will. Now, here's your court saying, when you're in custody, now you've got to make a critical distinction here between whether you're in custody or not in custody. If it's a routine traffic stop, friend, you are in custody. And if you don't think you are and you're a little uh, befuddled or you're not quite sure, just ask the policeman, sir, am I in custody? Uh, no, you, this is just a routine traffic stop. Thank you very much, sir. I'll see you next time. You turn and walk two steps. Wait a minute. Hold it. Yeah, what do you want? Well, you can't leave. You just told me I could. I did not. Well, certainly you did. I asked you plainly if I was in custody, and you told me, no, this is a routine traffic stop. Well, well, you can't leave. Well, then I must be in custody. And if I'm in custody, then Miranda versus Arizona comes into play, doesn't it, officer? And if Miranda comes into play here, I don't want to answer any of your questions. So therefore, would you please get me counsel, and would you please call your field supervisor, and let's discuss how we want to continue from here. That's the way I handle them. Drives them right up the walls. Turn over here to page 461. Down two-thirds of the way down where it says, In criminal trials in the courts of the United States, wherever a question arises whether a confession is competent because not voluntary, the issue is controlled by that portion of the Fifth Amendment commanding that no person shall be compelled. Underline that word, compelled, again. See, you can do it voluntarily. Where did you bury the gun? Oh, it's over there. Oh, where would you put the body? Oh, I got that in my trunk of my car. You can volunteer any time you want to, but you cannot be compelled in any criminal case to be a witness against himself. Don't have to talk to anybody. As a matter of fact, the first thing I teach my students is keep your mouth shut, don't say anything, and shut up. You're going to jail. You're out on the freeway. Policeman stops you. You're going to jail, boy. Make up your mind to it. If you think that policeman out there is going to be a nice guy, and that he's going to find this ounce of marijuana or whatever it is you got on you, concealed weapon, or you got a gun in your knapsack or something, they're going to haul you off to jail and charge you with some trumped-up charge like obstructing and delaying. You demand your rights, and they'll charge you with obstructing and delaying. If you don't demand your rights, then they'll just violate the Fourth and Fifth Amendment rights and search your knapsack and find something with which to trump up some charges and haul you off to jail. Happens here every day. Every day. These people... You know, these police here in Ada County, Idaho, just entrap people day in and day out, and I can produce 50 witnesses in court on any afternoon. It gives me two weeks to get them subpoenaed in, and I can produce witnesses any afternoon to testify to that. And that's a fact. If you don't think that's true, why don't you prosecute me? Why don't you sue me or something? I can go out to the state penitentiary and subpoena in any 50 people out there and get five or ten, and I just do that at random. Down at the bottom of page 465. Now notice that the Supreme Court's going to Escobedo. You ever notice how the court says in Escobedo or in Lilborn or in Boyd versus U.S.? 
I bet you thought that the boys, when they went to decide a case, went into a back room and they drew straws or they just said, well, how do you vote and let's uh, cast our votes here. These people don't vote like that. They go in and they write paper and they research and they look up this question and they say, well, how have we decided this before? And then what new ruling or how, what new application are we going to use in this case? In this case, the only thing that was new was that the police now have to tell you you have the right to remain silent. You always did have the right. It's just that there weren't enough people who knew that, and then they'd get in there, and the police are beating up on them, and so they couldn't withstand the beating. And so we had to have some methodology whereby we could compel the police to stop breaking the law. You think that the police are the people who are the champions of law and order. Got news for you. Boy, you out of touch with reality. The police are the number one criminals in our society, and the politicians are probably number two. There's some kind of a fight between whether politicians are the, are the biggest criminals, and I know some of you are going to say, well, no, that's not true. The bankers are. And, well, let me tell you from my experience, the policemen are the first line of personnel who touch that citizen. Now, when the politician is taking graft and bribes and passing unconstitutional laws or trying to oppress people and raise money through uh, police uh, uh, regulations or the police powers of the state, he's a third or fourth party away from this. It's this policeman who's out here arresting you because of these alleged acts and violating your rights right there on the spur of the moment, right there eyeball to eyeball. He's the first person you come in contact with who violates the Fourth Amendment, the Fifth Amendment, the Sixth Amendment, uh, perhaps the First Amendment, the Fourteenth Amendment. Right there when he's asking the very first question, what's your name? Well, sir, I'd rather not answer that. I'd rather invoke all of my constitutional rights here. You're under arrest, you hippie. Do that every day. In the Escobedo case, watching now how the court goes into other cases, they say, however, the police did not relieve the defendant of the anxieties which they had created in the interrogation room. Rather, they denied his request for the assistance of counsel. So, here's a fellow named Escobedo. I don't know if the guy's guilty or not. Who cares? He demanded counsel, didn't he? And if we're going to say, well, in Escobedo, we don't care if he had counsel or not because he's a guilty criminal, and on top of that, what's worse, he's a Mexican, and that's, that's worse than being a criminal. See how that comes down? In other words, we, the citizens, don't care about that one lone individual over there. When was the last time you went out to your county jail and talked to some of the prisoners out there to find out whether or not your county jail is entrapping people and just throwing them in jail on trumped-up charges? Probably never. Yet here's a case where they're taking him in. He's asked for counsel. I don't ask. I demand counsel. But on the other hand, if a person requests counsel, isn't he entitled to counsel? Well, the police wouldn't give it to him. This, this heightened his dilemma and made, this is page 466, and made his later statements the product of this compulsion. So the court is saying we've got to protect people, persons, individuals. One man at a time has to have a separation between this government power, this awesome, gigantic government power, guns, badges, administration, jails, people, personnel, money, power, politics, that one man has got to be separated from all of that. He's got to be protected. Page 467. Let's take a look at a few more of these comments. It's uh, got a big Roman numeral 3 up here at the top of the page, where it says, Today, then, there can be no doubt that the Fifth Amendment privilege is available outside of criminal court proceedings and serves to protect persons in all settings. Get that? All settings. I don't care what the setting is. All is an all-encompassing word. So whether you're out on the road or you're in your living room or you're in the courtroom or you're in jail or wherever you are in all settings in which their freedom of action is curtailed in any, 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 underline it, significant way from being compelled to incriminate themselves. Well, how could you possibly incriminate yourself by telling them your name? or your address, or your social security number, or your date of birth, or on and on and on. How could you possibly incriminate yourself? Why don't you ask yourself, well, how can it possibly help me? 
maybe if you can answer that question, then maybe you can sit there and say, well, I think I'll cooperate with the police. I think I'll prove to them I'm not guilty. And I wouldn't waste the time of day trying to prove whether I'm guilty or not guilty. You people want to spend $2,000 and bring me into court for obstructing and delaying a police officer because I'm demanding my Fifth Amendment rights? Come on, let's go. Let's go have a little fun. We'll rack up another victory. And pretty soon I'll get my 20 cases lined up in which I can then come back and say, there have been in Ada County, Idaho, against George Gordon, a number of cases filed, of which these are the 20 cases, all successfully defended in a long train of events spanning some two years in which the prosecutors, the police, and the politicians have conspired to deprive Mr. Gordon of his civil and constitutional rights. And I'll have the evidence because 20 cases against one man is going to be pretty significant proof positive that I have been singled out to be prosecuted. You show me another citizen that's got 20 successful defenses. And that's what you want to be doing in your county, defending against all of these police intrusions into your rights. Well, let's go on here on page 436. We have concluded that without proper safeguards, the process of in-custody interrogation of persons suspected of accused or accused, rather, of crime, like I told you how they locked me up in solitary confinement for five days, accused of not having a driver's license. Mm -hmm. Contains inherently compelling pressures which work to undermine the individual's will to resist, that's brainwashing, and to compel him to speak where he would not otherwise do so freely. Yeah, most people speak when you've got lighted cigarette butts on their back or you've broken their bones. Bottom of the page where it's underlined, it says, Our decision in no way creates a constitutional straitjacket which will handicap sound efforts at reform, nor is it intended to have this effect. The court's not sitting there saying, what we're trying to do here is to hamstring the police and turn criminals loose. You notice how often that your high court uses the word individual and freedom? You won't see that in your magistrate courts. You won't see that in those star chamber proceedings that you're accustomed to going into, I think you'll find due process of law in the higher court. I think you'll find individual protections for civil liberties. Bottom of the page where it says, at the outset, if a person in custody is to be subjected to interrogation, he must first be informed in clear and unequivocal terms that he has the right to remain silent clear, unequivocal terms. Down in the middle, where it says, uh, we're on page 468 now, so follow along, it says the Fifth Amendment privilege is so fundamental to our system of constitutional rule and the expedient of giving an adequate warning as to the availability of the privilege, so simple, we will not pause to inquire in individual cases whether the defendant was aware of his rights without a warning being given. <laughs> Where's your court saying, we're not even going to waste time asking if the rights have been given? Well, let me tell you, I've only run into a policeman about three or four times in the last five years that ever read me my warning or even knew what it was. They don't any more follow this Supreme Court directive here than they fly. Now, there's probably some exceptions, and there's probably some of you policemen out there that are rare, rare exceptions and understand the Constitution. I've... I shouldn't say all policemen are this way because that's absolutely not true. But boy, let me tell you, the majority of them are. I'll bet you 90% of the police, just like 90% of the lawyers, are totally incompetent for the jobs that they hold. And that's just the way life is. If they weren't, then why did we have this Miranda case? Why does your Supreme Court so thoroughly chastise and castigate the police in this, in this case? So the Fifth Amendment privilege then is so fundamental to our system of constitutional rule. It is fundamental, ladies and gentlemen. It isn't an ancillary issue or a collateral matter. It is an absolute fundamental. It's the bedrock upon which our Constitution is founded, about which our individual liberties and rights, without it, we would have no rights. 
talk to a lawyer sometime about rights and constitution and they've been to law school and they'll come out and say the sovereign's the legislature over here and if you don't like their rules then you lobby in front of your your democracy i'm not a subject of a democracy i'm a sovereign in a constitutional republic now the rest of the people can so subvert their rights to this democratic process if they want to but they don't have to there's a footnote down here in the bottom i want to read this footnote to you because it's pretty significant it is probable that even today when there is much less ignorance about these matters than formerly there is still a general belief that you must answer all questions put to you by a policeman you know what i told you well, when you went to school, you were taught to answer every question put to you. And so the Supreme Court recognizes that the average guy, you know, the average Joe Sixpack, he's convinced that, you know, I have to answer if the policeman asks. Or at least that it'll be worse for you if you don't. <laughs> That's the basic theory, isn't it? In accord with our decision today, it is impermissible to penalize an individual for exercising his Fifth Amendment privilege when he's under police custodial interrogation. I'm in the police station. Get this, ladies and gentlemen. I'm in the police station. The guy comes over and says, we're going to book you in. Sir, uh, I want a court order, and I demand all of my rights under the Constitution, waive none of my rights at any time, including my right to time, and specifically invoke Davis versus Mississippi in this particular instance. I don't want to be in custody without counsel present and have you take my fingerprints which could later be used in an incriminating way against me for some other charge and this dope charges me for obstructing and delaying a police officer in the course of his duties because I won't give up my constitutional right that's right I bet you a dollar to donut that I'll get a fair hearing when I get to Washington these are the words out of the Supreme Court. And I'm asking you, well, why doesn't the policeman know that? Why doesn't that policeman, instead of charging me with obstructing and delaying a policeman, apply this constitutional law to my individual civil, civil rights and liberties and quit wasting your $2,000 in tax money? And believe you me, when we go into court, we're going to spend all of $2,000. I wouldn't have it any other way. We're not only going to go to trial, I'm going to bring 10 or 15 witnesses in. And I'm not even going to breathe, Miranda, until we get to my half of the case, and then I'm going to lay them away. And then this poor jury will probably come in because the judge is going to tell them to find me guilty because it's their duty to uphold the, the statute in Idaho Code in contradistinction to this constitutional mandate from the Supreme Court of the United States. That's right. Well, it's a long educational pro uh, process, and it's going to take some time. I'm not saying we're going to change things overnight, but I'll tell you, we change things here in Ada County, and I'll tell you, you can change things wherever you are.